Chapter 11, Vonowing in Cities. According to the 2010 U.S. Census Bureau, 80.7% of Americans live in urban areas. Many likely do so by choice, but others do so as a requirement for employment or even possibly other reasons. For example, knowing no other lifestyle or not being comfortable with living in any other location. Clearly then, some Vanu lifestyle changes may not be appealing or possible for many folk. The question to ask then becomes, is it possible to Vanu in cities? This topic is one that Rayo did not spend much time on, at least in the publications that I've been able to acquire. In Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, he wrote a two-page, 800-word article on it. But that's it. So this is one strategy that we will have to develop mostly in its entirety for the Vanu podcast. This section should be considered an introduction to the strategy at best, and more extensive follow-up after further thought, consideration, and brainstorming. Rayo highlighted five different approaches to vanoing in cities. Namely, one, anonymity. Two, gather with fellows in a ghetto. Three, a blend of concealment and deception. Four, a den or camouflaged camp on unowned lands, such as a public park. Five, van nomadism with city squat spots. We'll cover each of these separately. Anonymity. Regardless of whether or not you're living in a city, Ivanoan should always exercise security culture when entering the statist servile society. If you're living there full time, then it's doubly important. Practicing the gray man is absolutely crucial. As Rayo advises, be visible, but not noticeable. Conform outwardly while doing your own thing in secret. Be inconspicuous. Remaining anonymous is becoming more and more difficult as time goes on, especially after 9-11. Many of the suggestions Rayo and other Vanuans made are largely irrelevant. For example, renting under a nom de plume. That is certainly not possible today. Most rental companies require a background and a credit check, both of which require your social security number. Even if you're simply selling some old video games to Mega Replay, personally identifiable information, i.e. a driver's license, is almost always required for anything. And for some Vanuans, remaining anonymous is simply not enough. Rayo explicates, for me, anonymity alone was unsatisfactory because of city psychological pressures. I was immersed in an alien culture with values hostile to my own. Whether or not I was especially vulnerable, I felt vulnerable. The city psychological pressures are definitely one of the biggest obstacles to overcome when vanoing in cities. Not only can it be mentally taxing and exhausting being surrounded by statists all the time, but these pressures often pull once dedicated freedom pioneers back into submissive, conventional lifestyles. As of 1972, Rayo and others didn't really have any solutions to this. As of today, I really don't either. If you do, please let me know. Gather with fellows into a ghetto. This might be the strangest recommendation Rayo proposes in his book, so much so that I really don't have much to say about it. I'll let him explain it for you. A way to reduce psychological pressures is to gather with fellows into a ghetto a second approach to city Vanu. One loses anonymity with respect to larger culture as one develops subculture speech, customs, mannerisms, and dress. But one becomes a relatively indistinguishable member of the subculture, requiring that any organized aggressor attack everyone or no one. All look alike. This doesn't always stop aggressors. Witness Jews in Nazi Germany, Japan, and U.S., the recommendations made by Walt Haywood presume ghettos of like-minded people. Ghettos are also possible in rural areas. The Takilma area southeast of Cave Junction, Oregon, is almost a freak ghetto. While freaks may not be in the majority yet, there are enough to render the area unattractive for anti-freaks, causing most land up for sale to be bought by freaks, etc. Analogous to what happens in new black ghettos and cities, how much protection this provides remains to be seen. There have been quite a few arrests for growing and using pot, etc. A bigger crunch will come when substantial numbers of freak children become old enough for slave school. Will the Supreme Court require long hairs and short hairs to be intermixed by busing? Or will it compel kids to cut their hair middle length with the length set by the majority vote every four years? I suppose it's one way to surround yourself with like-minded people. But like Rayo, I'm quite skeptical of the proposition. If the bludgies were trying to shut this down in the 70s, this is probably a lifestyle they wouldn't tolerate today. That, and do you really think there are enough Vanuans interested in this to make it viable? It's probably as likely as the state being abolished tomorrow. A blend of concealment and deception. 
This is one of the most practical and realistic approaches Rayo presents. The idea is to construct hidden soundproofed apartments and workshops beneath or within an owned building, ostensibly used for other purposes. For example, let's say that John is a Vanuin who works as a mechanic and that he has his own shop. He could construct a hidden apartment within that would only be accessible to him and that only he would have knowledge of. Rayo also notes that such chambers could be blast, fire, and fallout resistant, and that it offers some protection against day-to-day -day predation. Another example of a hidden bedchamber can be found in the terrific crypto-anarchist novella, Hashtag Agora. What are some considerations to take into account for someone interested in this blend of concealment and deception? Firstly, it's important to conceal the fact that you're going to be constructing anything. Nosy neighbors or bludgies might inquire further. Also, think carefully how you will enter and exit the premises, whether you decide upon a false wall, a hidden staircase, underneath tiled floor, or whatever else. The idea is to avoid heavy foot traffic that could be picked up by the bludgies or other coercers. The disadvantages for this strategy are similar to the ones discussed in the anonymity section above. The city's psychological pressures would still be an obstacle with little or no solutions at this time, in addition to the fact that even constructing this hidden bedchamber would be complicated. This approach has some potential, but it needs to be developed upon. Consider brainstorming on it and help come up with a way to make it practical. Build a den or a camouflaged camp on unowned land. This specific approach is actually quite similar to Wilderness Vanu. The main difference being that this den or camp would be located in a public park inside of a city. There's only one real advantage to this strategy, which is easier access to the city. Other than that, this one is riddled with problems and obstacles. Of course, concealing your structure in a public park is going to be far more difficult than concealing a polyethylene A-tent in the Siskiyou National Forest. As with the other approaches, there are general hazards of city living, including smog and a nuclear threat. This strategy has actually been tested, though, and with short and long-term success. In Preform Inform, it was reported that a man built a shack and lived undetected for 17 years in a Portland city park. One of my colleagues from the UK recently sent me an image of a tent, right out in the open, located on public land. He informed me that it had been there unmolested for a few weeks. Obviously, this individual in question was not practicing concealment. It's worth noting that it would be wise to develop concealment skills in remote areas so as to get experience without the higher risk of a harassment by the bludge. Once you develop your competency in the wilderness, then you can opt for better city access. Van Nomadism with City Squat Spots This is an approach that we already touched upon in Chapter 6 and is successfully practiced every single day all over the world. There is so much self-liberational media walking you through exactly how to do it and what considerations to take into account, it's not even funny. Some individuals choose van nomadism for this purpose alone, as it still provides them access to the city and their place of employment. Rayo elaborates on how to successfully stealth camp. Private land, such as backyards of friends, is probably safer than the streets for long stays. The vehicle not need to be as self-contained since utilities are close at hand. Off-the-road performance isn't important. Appearance, conventionality, license plates, etc. are important. A few other squat spots you might consider. Walmart parking lots? Walmart has always catered to RVers and travelers, but this possibility seems to be on its way out. Reason being, local governments are passing ordinances saying it's illegal to sleep in parking lots. That said, some van nomads still do it, but it's recommended to only sleep there one night at a time. Hotel parking lots. There are almost always vehicles in hotel parking lots, meaning that if you have a stealth van, you'll likely be able to get a night's rest without issue. Mechanic shops. This one is a bit more risky, but it is a potential option. Obviously, there are always cars being worked on at mechanic shops, many of them remaining on the lot overnight. You may have luck sleeping there, as long as you're up early and gone before they're open. I'll leave it there for now, and I will point you in the direction of YouTube. Just search for stealth camping and you'll be provided with plenty of results. In summation, it's extremely important that this strategy be developed. Most folks are truly stuck in the city for whatever reason, but it doesn't mean they are unable to practice Vanu. Sure, it may be more difficult in some ways, but keep in mind, Vanu is not an all or nothing thing, nor is it black and white. Examine your current lifestyle and your goals. In addition to what it would take to get you from where you are to where you want to be, then make a plan and execute it.